In this video, we introduce our very last major clade, the chordata. So here are the animals we've covered thus far. We're in the deuterostomia. We've covered the ambulacria the, that includes the echinoderms and the hemichordates. But now we're going into the chordata, and we're going to cover the two basal lineages first, the urochordates and the cephalochordates. But before we get into those lineages specifically, I want to talk about the synapomorphies associated with the chordata itself. And there are five key developmental synapomorphies that all chordates share at least some point during their development. So these include, first, myotomes, muscle bands that are found in segments running the length of the body. So it's a serial homology that we've talked about uh, in structures previously, but it's these specific muscle bands. This includes a muscular post-anal tail. So past the anus, which is seen in this diagram here, is here. We have a supported and muscular tail structure past that. All of these lineages also show at some point a dorsal hollow nerve cord that runs the length of the body. And this contrasts with some of the organisms we talked about previously. Most of the protostomes had a ventrally located nerve cord. And the ventral position is likely the ancestral state, and we see that there has been a transition in the chordates to this uh, dorsal position. Running parallel to the dorsal hollow nerve cord is a support structure called the notochord. This is a flexible support rod that runs the length of the body and we'll see is also homologous to the vertebra in vertebrates. Associated with the pharyngeal gill slits is a pharyngeal endostyle, which has been modified to form a thyroid gland in some vertebrates. Early function of this includes simply the production of mucus used in feeding, but also it is associated with the production of hormones. So of the two lineages we're going to cover today, the first is the cephalochordata, commonly referred to as the lancelet, about 35 species of these. They're fish-like animals that are blade-shaped in their body form, and that's why they're called the lancelets. Adults, in this case, retain all of these five synapomorphic chordate characteristics um, in both the larval and adult stages. When we get to the urochordata, which are commonly referred to as the tunicates, this is a more diverse group, about 3,000 species, but these are very different animals, at least in their adult form. They're more like these bag-like structures uh, that are filter feeders. They retain all of the synapomorphic chordate characteristics only in the larval stages. In the adult stages, they have secondarily lost many of these anatomical features. And before we go into each of these groups, I also want to remind you that in the hemichordata, that term hemi refers to the fact that they share some of the characteristics of chordates. So while they don't have all five of the synapomorphic characters, they do share two. Remember the hemichordates had a dorsal nerve cord and they also had pharyngeal gill slits. All chordates are triple blastic, bilaterally symmetrical, at least in the larval phases, and eucelomate. The coelom is really greatly reduced or absent in the adult form in some, but in the larval phases you can see its development. The cephalochordates and the urochordates have a single layer of epithelium with an underlying supporting dermis. And on top of this epidermis, the urochordates secrete an overlying cellulose-based tunic structure. And the fact that that has cellulose in it is interesting because animals don't produce cellulose. The cellulose material is likely derived from horizontal gene transfer from bacteria. So at one point in time, the DNA from a bacterium that can produce cellulose, those genes were incorporated into the DNA of a tunicate. Oftentimes viruses are involved in this transfer process. The tunics themselves vary in thickness, texture, and color. They can be very soft to a very leathery. Some even have calcareous spicule-like structures embedded within them to uh, reduce the chance that they're going to be eaten. And some are really brightly colored, and this is associated with the endosymbionts that live in some of them. Cephalochordates have a notochord as their main support structure, so this is this uh, pliable support rod running the length of the body. Most urochordates 
have a larval notochord in the tadpole larval phase shown here, but they lack the notochord as adults. In this case, the tunic on the outside provides a little bit of exoskeletal support and protection. Cephalochordates have these large myotomes running the length of their uh, dorsolateral body wall, as you can see here. The urochordates, however, uh, have these thinner circular and longitudinal muscles found in bands in their more membranous body walls. Remember, they're more sac-like. The cephalochordates also have a very well-developed dorsal nerve cord that runs the length of the body parallel to the no notochord, but they do have relatively limited cephalization. There is a slight enlargement of the nerve cord anteriorly in the head region. As far as sensory structures, they, some species do have photosensitive eye spots, but they're not really vision forming. And they do have mechano and chemosensory cells in their oral hood, which is used for sorting food. And you may be wondering, why well, it looks like these animals are pretty good in locomotion. Uh, why don't they have more cephalization? It turns out they, they are really good swimmers, but most of the time they're in burrows with their, just their head extended and their uh, filter feeding. And so that kind of explains the lack of a great deal of cephalization. Also spread out throughout their body, they have a variety of tactile sensors in their epithelium so that they can uh, sense their environment using their overall body epithelium. As far as the urochordates go, the larvae do have a large dorsal nerve cord that runs the length of the body with an anterior cerebral ganglion. But during development, this is greatly reduced in the adults. They do show a remnant of the cerebral ganglion and they have mechanoreceptors kind of forming rings around the siphons, which are used for uh, food separation as they're pumping water through their body and, and capturing suspended food particles. Most of the tunicates we'll see are sessile, but there are pelagic forms, and the pelagic forms have more sensory structures associated with uh, sensing the direction of light and also gravity. As I mentioned, because they do have the large muscle bands, the cephalochordates are strong swimmers, but they're relatively erratic swimmers. They don't have really good um, directional control because of a lack of stabilizing fins. The locomotion comes from coordinated contraction of these myotome bands and the vertical tail fin. What these myotomes do is they bend the elastic notochord and then when those muscles on that side relax, the elasticity in the notochord uh, snaps back resulting in these body undulations. Again, most of the tunicates are sessile, but there are some pelagic forms. In these cases, water from the atrial siphon is used for some jet propulsion. All chordates do have a complete digestive tract. The cephalochordates, um, as I mentioned, are suspension or filter feeders. They live their lives in burrows with just their head protruding, and they have water and food uh, driven into the digestive tract by water flow created by a structure called the wheel organ. The wheel organ is this ciliated structure that creates the water flow and into the body. They also can bring water and suspended food into their body through the ciliated pharyngeal gill bars or gill slits. Now when you're feeding like this, you're bringing in food particles, but you're also bringing in things that are non-digestible. So coarse sediments are filtered out by buccal cerci and velar tentacles. The food that is captured in the mucus is then passed over the wheel organ and the pharyngeal gill slits, as mentioned previously. And they're captured in this mucus that is produced by the endostyle. Food that is then brought into the body is digested in the intestines and an extension called the hepatic cecum. Wastes are then moved uh, posteriorly to the anus for expulsion. Now during this process, they're bringing in a lot of water to the body too, and water from the gill slits that is, is collected moves to the atrium and exits what is called the atriopore. Cephalochordates have a closed circulatory system. Blood is pumped by a heart and also using peristaltic muscular contractions in the blood vessels themselves. The urochordates have a partially closed circulatory system where blood is pumped by a heart and also peristaltic uh, blood vessels, but it's not delivered through a, a tiny series of capillary beds. Instead, it's delivered to larger spaces around organs uh, through these vessels, and then uh, the vessels collect this from these spaces, returning it to the heart.
Gas exchanges primarily takes place by these ventral body extension called metapleural folds. They do have well-developed gill arches, but the gill arches are primarily associated with feeding and not as much respiration. In urochordates, gas exchange does occur across the inner body wall and then also across the, the pharynx and the associated gill slits there. Cephalochordates do have a proto-nephridia-like structure and nitrogenous waste are then uh, eliminated through the atriopore, just like using the excess water that's brought in from the gills to wash that away. In urochordates, diffusion is the main mechanism. Um, some species do have a renal vesicle associated with the pharynx, but they do have a large enough surface area that they can just uh, use diffusion to get rid of their nitrogenous waste. And all these organisms still are ectothermic. There is no asexual reproduction known in cephalochordates. Uh, sexually, they are dioecious, uh, showing oviparous reproduction patterns. The gametes are located in the walls of the atrium, and then this region of the body actually ruptures to release the gametes for external fertilization. Urochordates do show budding and fragmentation. And as far as sexual reproduction, most of these are monaceous, though they individuals have a single ovary and a single testis. Gametes released into an atrial chamber for expulsion, but they show a, a wide diversity of, of when those gametes were released or if they're released at all, and how nutrients are delivered from to the zygotes or do they have to supply their own nutrition via yolk. So they have some oviparous forms, some ovoviviparous forms, and some viviparous forms. Fertilization itself is variable, so they some have internal and external fertilization patterns. They are deuterostomes, so they show radial holoblastic cleavage as the ancestral state in chordates. But the fate of the blastopore does vary. So in some cases it becomes the anus, that's the case in the cephalochordates, um, but it, the blastopore actually closes before the anus is formed in the urochordate, so it, it forms elsewhere. The extent of larval development also varies between these two chordate groups. In the cephalochordates, the larva exist for an extended period of time, for several months basically, dispersing and, and foraging and going through development before developing the adult morphology. Most urochordates produce a relatively brief, what is called tadpole larva. And then we see that, um, that, that we're talking about a period of days or weeks in which this tadpole larva will disperse, find a, a place to site and metamorphose into the adult, which looks very different from the tadpole larva itself. And again, you can see in the tadpole larva, we have all of the five characteristics of a chordate, but you lack many of those in the adult form. Cephalochordates are iteroparous, so they will reproduce several times during their life, and they can live generally from two to five years. Their reproduction is usually limited to a season associated with warmer water temperatures. As I mentioned, the urochordates mature very quickly from the tadpole larval stage, and they can show really rapid population growths um, associated with planktonic availability. So when the food supply is really high, um, they grow really quickly and reproduce very quickly, and so they can increase their populations uh, incredibly fast. Their lifespan is really variable. Some do have substantial abilities to re regenerate damaged body parts, uh, some only live for a few weeks, others can live uh, up to 12 years. A lot of things like to eat these animals, so they're, the threats of predation are, are pretty extensive. So one of the things that they can do is they just avoid detection by crypsis or burrowing, but they also do have chemical defenses, and this is where some of those symbiotic bacteria come into play. So those that give the organism the aposomatic coloration they're sequestering toxins associated with the bacteria, and they are advertising this fact. So, for example, in some species, there's a sequestration of large amounts of vanadium, which is a, a toxic uh, substance used in defense of sun. Simply, the production of copious amounts of mucus appears to deter sun predation, so that, that mucus is used primarily in foraging, but also it has a defensive capability. And as I mentioned in the tunicates, the urochordates, the tunic itself can be embedded with spines and leathery thick protection to uh, deter predators.
And then finally, in some of the pelagic forms that are dwelling in deeper ocean waters, they can flash bioluminescent patterns to startle potential predators. Now the cephalochordates live solitarily in burrows. Uh, they can be found in really great densities, but there's no true social system. The urochordates, uh, again, most of these are solitary, and, but can also be found in, in clusters when there's a, a kind of lack of a suitable habitat, and they all have to kind of find the limited amount of hard substrates that they can attach to. But there are some social species of urochordates, and they uh, show these interconnected clonally produce, asexually reproduce through um, binary fission in the case of the asexual forms, or in some cases actually genetically distinct individuals will cluster together to form these colonies. Urochordates frequently have bacterial, protist, and invertebrate endosymbionts. These can be found in the tunic itself, sometimes in the pharynx, sometimes in the siphons. And in these cases, the hosts benefit uh, from increase potentially uh, digestive efficiency by using, say, bacteria to help break down food products, increased efficiencies in nitrogen production or metabolism, and then again using some of the secondary compounds that bacteria produce as uh, toxic compounds uh, for their own defense. And then the endosymbiotic uh, organisms are getting advantage by just living in their host and having a safe place to live. There are also some endosymbiotic crustaceans that uh, can live sometimes commensally, sometimes parasitically in tunicates, depending on uh, the, the amount of food that they actually utilize. The cephalochordates, as I mentioned, live in these sandy burrows where they're filter feeders that's usually restricted to relatively shallow marine waters. Again, they can occur in great densities and this attracts certain organisms. They are an important food source for crustaceans, fishes, and, and some shorebirds during migration will really rely on feeding on cephalochordates. And humans have even taken advantage of this. And so you can find throughout the world lancelets as a key ingredient in certain Asian, Latin American, and even European uh, dishes. Urochordates also are marine. Most of them are benthic, but there are quite a few pelagic species that are floating around. They're incredibly efficient filter feeders and they can occur in, in great densities. Unfortunately, they oftentimes will attach to ship hulls and marine equipment, and this allows them to be transported around the world. And so invasive species end up being introduced into ecological communities where they may outcompete the native filter feeder species, and that can greatly alter the ecological communities and its natural functions. Turns out some of the products that urochordates make that is used in their predator defense um, have also some uh, anti-cancer potential, and so it's been researched by the pharmaceutical companies. Both of these lineages appear to be generally tolerant to ocean acidification and temperature increases. There have been a few situations, however, where high ocean temperatures have been shown to, to increase mortality in some uh, Mediterranean tunicates, but in general they seem to be fairly tolerant uh, of increasing water temperatures. So in review, we're covering the cephalochordates, which are the lancelets, and the urochordates, the tunicates. We also talked about how all chordates, including members of these two groups, uh, share five general characteristics, the myotomes of the muscular postanal tail, dorsal hollow nerve cord, notochord, and an endostyle or thyroid gland. Cephalochordates show these uh, into the adult phase, but the urochordates only show this as a larva. The triploblastic eucelomates and uh, bilaterally symmetrical as adults in the case of the cephalochordates and the larval forms in both. They have an epidermis and underlying dermis, and the tunicates actually have a cellulose-based tunic surrounding their body. As far as support, the notochord is the key part of that in the lancelets, but the tunic and the hydrostatic pressure is the main skeletal uh, support structure in tunicates. Well-developed muscular myotomes in the lancelets, smaller muscles found in the tunicates. Nervous system, they do have a dorsal nerve cord and some cephalization in the lancelets. Uh, it's greatly reduced in at least the adult tunicates. They do show a diversity of sensory structures primarily associated with fil filtering out 
um, food from non-food particles as their filter feeders. The cephalochordates are shallow water swimmers, um, but they spend most of their time in burrows. Eurochordates, most of them are sessile, but some are pelagic and mainly floating with a little bit of maybe jet propulsion capabilities, but not a lot of directional capability there. As I mentioned, they're suspension feeders with a complete digestive tract. And make sure you know the key structures and, and how their feeding works. Cephalochordates have a closed or uh, circulatory system, and it's partially closed in the urochordates. Respiration is primarily by metapleural folds in the cephalochordates, um, but there is also some cutaneous respiration and gills uh, used in respiration. But the gills are primarily used in respiration in the urochordates and less in the cephalochordates. Excretion is through proteinephridia in the cephalochordates and primarily diffusion in the urochordates. Asexual reproduction is seen only in the tunicates, never seen in the cephalochordates. And there's some pretty big differences in sexual reproduction. The lancelets are dioecious where the tunicates are monoecious. And the lancelets are a little more restricted in having oviparous external fertilization only, and it's much more variable in the tunicates. The deuterostomes showing radial cleavage, but there is variation in what the blastopore becomes. It becomes the anus only in the lancelets. Larval development and length also varies between these groups with a long stage, larval stage in lancelets, but a very brief and rapid metamorphosis from the tadpole larva and tunicates to the adult tunicate form. They're highly variable in their lifespans, and they're variable in their defenses, relying in many cases on simply encryptus or burrowing, but then also secondary use of chemicals that are derived from their bacterial endosymbionts, simple mucus, uh, spiny tunics, and in some cases flashes of bioluminescence in the deep sea forms. There are some social urochordates, uh, but the in many cases you may see clusters of both tunicates and cephalochordates simply due to a lack of, of general availability of habitat that forces them into kind of colonial-like setting, but there's no real interaction of individuals. Many of them do have some symbiotic relationships uh, in the tunicates. The lancelets are a very important food source for many other organisms. And the tunicates, we talked about how important they are as filter feeders and how they can be transported to areas that they are not native to, and that can cause some problems as far as ecosystem functioning by out-competing native species.